Hello and welcome to Conversations with Dr. Westman. Today is episode number 12 and today we're going to be talking about is food quality important? How are things going, Eric? Great. How are you, Glenn? Very, very good. Thank you. Always good to chat with you. Um, you know, Eric, you, you, you always hear um, that in order to have optimal health, uh, the food quality needs to be absolutely perfect. Um, and, but the biggest ones you hear is that it has to be organic or grass-fed. I know that you've got very, very specific and particular ideas about this. How important is the food quality? Well, this is a very common thing to talk about. And I remember I'm coming at this as mainly a scientist, as a clinical physician, helping people, not from a, um, you know, let's build a rocket, go to the moon kind of thing to, you know, the precision. So the, the, there was a kind of a big picture view and then a lot of things that quite aren't so important, but can get people sidetracked and, and um, confused. And the food quality is one of these things. And, you know, so again, let me just, from my perspective, I treat people or help people by changing the food in lots of different backgrounds, walks of life, um, eating from all different grocery stores, restaurants, fast food. And, and I have to make the program work however someone chooses to live their life. I mean, so I can't come in and say, okay, you have to go eat grass-fed beef or you have to go get organic whatever. <laughs> you know, the, um, uh, the perspective that I bring is what can work across a wide variety of platforms and food qualities. And I found that the, you know, emphasis on grass-fed beef, for example, is not necessary. I mean, so just, you know, it's not that it's not a good thing. <laughs> it's just I can help people even if they're not eating grass-fed beef. So um, talking about this point and something that we are very, very excited about, and um, we're going to be speaking about this a lot more in the coming months because um, we've got a new book coming out that you've written with Amy Berger, um, and that's coming out on the 1st of December. Now, um, why am I talking about that? Because in that book, you make mention of something called the sound modulator as an analogy. Um, um, and this speaks specifically to food quality um, as well as some other factors. Can you just um, elaborate a little bit on the sound modulator? Sure. So, and the new book, yeah, we've worked a, a while on it, kind of keeping it secret <laughs> as best we can. Uh, it's now uh, posted at Amazon, at least the shell of it, amazon.com. So um, what um, the kind of overlap between what Amy Berger and I have been talking about for a long time is the simplicity of, uh, of the low carb approach is one of its um, advantages and in really calling cards of why it's such a great way to live and eat. So how, how to come up with a kind of metaphor to show that there's some things that are more important than others. Uh, and you know, the most important thing for us is, is the carbohydrate quantity, the amount of carbs and the lesser important thing. So the, the highest thing on the sound modulator or the, the dial on the amplifier, you know, however you want to call it, um, is the amount of carbohydrate in the food because of the impact on the blood sugar and the insulin. So now then there's going to be all these other little minor or lesser important things that, you know, eventually you want to address. But at first, the, the major uh, uh, um, benefits of a low carb diet is the low carb nature of the diet, not the organic, the grass fed, the, the keto this, the keto product, the oils, the, it's keeping the carbs low. So my understanding is that you've got the sound modulator with, um, with all sorts of different um, um, modules. So you've got diet is a, is, a, is a factor. You've got food quality is a factor. You've got sleep. You've got stress. You've got exercise. And so if I can understand correctly, what you're saying is, is that in the beginning, if you're treating somebody with type 2 diabetes or, or metabolic syndrome, uh, the dial needs to be all the way up on diet and all the way down on all the other factors initially. And once you've got a hand on all of those, then you can start playing around with other dials, sleep, stress, exercise, et cetera, food quality. These become a factor later on. But right now, 
you try to address the most important thing on the on the program, which is the the um, the actual the amount of carbs. And just for people that um, are curious, um, the book's going to be called "End Your Carb Confusion." Um, we know that there's a fortune of confusion out there. Um, the diets become uh, extremely popular over the last two years, but there's such a lot of misinformation. This is why we do a lot of these videos. Um, something else I wanted to chat with you about is another big one. You know, we often, and I've heard people say, oh, I can't believe Dr. Westman advocates for artificial sweeteners. Uh, in a perfect world, we'd have folks refraining from um, artificial sweeteners. Um, but at the end of the day, um, when you get someone on the program, just like that, that, that sound modulator where you've got everything, you know, um, uh, all the dial all the way up in terms of, um, uh, in terms of the amount of carbs that someone would have, um, the artificial sweeteners isn't a big deal for you. And you, you kind of believe that if it helps someone to, to build that bridge to get them to adhere to the program, that's the most important thing. Well, again, uh, it's not... Um... I don't strive to give people the perfect diet, the perfect diet on earth, because that's, that's just not achievable by so many people. It's not accessible. And, you know, being in a clinic, grounded in a clinic when people come to me for help and, and I have to work with them in their real daily lives, I figure out with the tools that I'm given how to do really well, you know, a lot better than their other diet that gave them diabetes and high blood pressure, all of that. So I've, um, if you will, made a compromise to say, well, maybe I won't give you the best diet on earth, but I'll give you one that's really darn good that will get you started down this path of health. Um, so the artificial sweeteners, you know, I don't know what I would do without them, actually, to get people off of sugar. And the concept of sugar addiction is something that has been around a long time. Uh, Gary Taubes, in his book, The Case Against Sugar, mentions how 100 years ago it was thought of as an addictive substance, basically. So for many people, sugar is addictive, and giving sugar-free alternatives is the way to get them off sugar eventually. Uh, and, you know, but to put it the other way, I don't know of any study that says you're going to live longer if you have an artificial or non-sugar sweetener. You know, so I'm not saying that this is what you should do to get longer life. <laughs> well, other than it's to keep you away from sugar. So uh, I know that the purists, the, the zealots, the, the uh, people who want to give you the best diet on earth and change social policy, and they're going to blend in the food quality and the idea that you shouldn't have anything sweet. And, you know, for some people, that's achievable and that's great. But for a lot of people, they can still have success without worrying about these smaller dials on the sound modulator. So um, I, it, what I'm hearing is that adherence is the bigger picture. So we've often chatted and um, I know that the numbers that we've, we've often chatted about is that you've got a hundred percent success rate. So that means somebody that comes to your office, that's got type two diabetes, someone who's obese, someone that has metabolic syndrome or hypertension, um, you've got a, you've got a, you've got a, 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 an unbelievable method to get a lot of these conditions into remission, uh, get people off their medications or reduce their medications substantially. But you've got a 50% adherence problem, which means that 50% of the people um, don't stay on the program. So it's not that the program doesn't work; it's that they don't stay on the program. And am I hearing correctly? What you're basically saying is that um, you allow certain things. It doesn't mean that this would be part of your perfect diet, so to speak, but these are the things that you allow in order to improve the adherence. Absolutely. I mean, that um, improve the adherence, uh, you can think of it as a temporary thing, uh, you know, but again, my perspective, I'll see some people who just want to optimize their health. I'll see some people who need to lose 300 pounds or 200 pounds. So it's a long-term adherence goal if someone has that in mind just as a as a treatment now, but if it's a lifestyle change to optimize their health i'll have the discussion that you know do you really need those artificial sweeteners unfortunately most people it kind of just fades away over time if you don't have sweet things you don't want sweet things uh, i'll ask people um you know ask me if i crave fruit and you know, it takes a moment and then no no just ask me and, I, and they'll say do you crave fruit and I'll say, well, no, I don't eat fruit. 
So you crave the things that you eat, the longer you stay away from something. Uh, you know, do you, uh, Glenn, do you crave cigarettes? No. Because? I smoke. You don't smoke, right. So, so there are a lot of changes that occur over time that I, I've um, learned to blend the, to make it simple. You know, a lot of people have busy lives. If you, uh, you know, again, it's what percentage of the population you're talking about, making it accessible, relatively easy. I even had one gentleman who shocks everyone when I talk about him, when it, all he did is eat at McDonald's and he lost, you know, over a hundred pounds of weight. So, and, and people, how could you do that? Fast food is evil. Well, it's the burger and no bun, or maybe two cheeseburgers, no bun, no fries, no sugar in the drink. So uh, um, the science, it, what's fascinating about it is that the science says one thing and then the, the politics, the social, the, 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 the ethics, all of this complicates it. But um, it's like, you know, to make a car, you have, you have axles and wheels and a chassis. You know, the fundamental of a low carb diet is keeping the carbs low. So um, one thing before we before we move on to the questions. Um, so I do want to just mention that in the book, um, you do address, we've got three different phases. Phase one is obviously treating type two diabetes, hypertension, metabolic syndrome, et cetera, et cetera. And then we've got phase two, phase three. These are people that can tolerate more carbs. And as people go on to the different phases from phase one to phase two to phase three, so those different items on the sound modulator start having to come into play. So people then should get better quality sleep. They should be less stressed. They should focus on their stress levels. They should focus on a little, a little bit of exercise um, and they should focus on the, the, the food quality. So I want to just make it clear that um, this is just a temporary um, idea that people need to get over in order to, to, to um, overcome the adherence issue that we have with the, with the program. So on that note, I'd like to um, head on over to some questions. And I've got the first one from Janine. And she says, I'm 67 years old and retired. Will I be able to afford this type of diet? Sure. <laughs> sure depending on what you choose. I would, so imagine, I would imagine that she's referring to, because obviously carbs are the cheapest items that can be purchased at the grocery store. And obviously, protein and fat is is the more expensive items that one oh, would, I see. would buy. Yeah. Well, you know, um, what is confusing to a lot of people, and even the the scientists who don't really understand this way of eating, will assume that you're going to eat the same amount of food. And they've done all these calculations on the cost and the the, the nutrients and all that. And actually, what happens if if you're going to lose weight, you're actually going to eat less. So depending on what you choose, again, you know, if you go to the highest end grocery stores that are not inexpensive, um, you, that's a choice. Uh, you could choose a lesser expensive grocery store, a box store, that sort of place. Um, actually, many of my patients tell me how much money they're saving on the food because they're not buying all the gratuitous junk foods and the snacks and all that. So when I explain this uh, in greater detail, basically if you're losing fat weight off your body, you don't have to buy that food anymore from the store because you're using your onboard pantry that, uh, so you're actually going to be eating less. Uh, now in the long run, um, I find most people kind of comfortably get into this intermittent fasting, one meal, two meal a day, sort of pattern, which I think is just fine as long as you're getting great nutrition when you do eat. Um, I think we've come through a false, well, a, a time of just abundance where we falsely think we need three meals a day with snacks and all that. So actually uh, quite counter to your belief, you might actually spend less money eating right. this way, depending on what you choose. Okay. Um, Debbie asks, when choosing um, protein, what are the best choices? Right, so, you know, I boil things down into the amino acids, the protein building blocks, and as long as there's a complete protein, and these are the, the, the meat, poultry, fish and shellfish and eggs, I don't worry so much about which one you have. Again, this gets into the advanced course of 
omega-6, omega-3, and you might be overly concerned about, I don't worry about that. In fact, I remember a doctor who was at a meeting, I was giving a presentation on the low carb diet. And he said, I'm doing the salmon Atkins diet. And I, I kind of looked and said, well, what do, you, what do you mean? I thought, you know, I thought it was meat. I thought it was, he said, no, Dr. Atkins focused on keeping the carbs low and I'm doing it with salmon. And so I learned from people who come up to me at meetings and that would be a fine way to do it. Uh, so I, I don't know that there is a best source of protein. In fact, it might come down to uh, the one you like most, as long as it's the, the meat, poultry, fish and shellfish and eggs, which, is, which has no carbs, which means, it, you know, if you haven't gone through the initial teaching, it means you really don't have to worry how much you have. Because what, about, what about if you're a vegetarian and, um, and the best you can get is um, plant-based protein uh, or soy type of protein? I mean, would you, what are your thoughts on this? I mean, I know that, that you've, you've got lots of people that are vegetarians and you put them on the program and they do just fine. Um, sure. Do you have any particular preference? I mean, for example, if you were going to choose soy-based protein versus meat, shellfish, fish, you'd obviously choose the, the, the latter. Well, I, I worry less about complete nutrition, adequate nutrition, if there are meat, uh, egg, uh, dairy sources. But you can do a low-carb vegetarian. You can do keto vegetarian. It's no problem. And you just keep the carbs low. Yeah. <laughs> and then, I mean, that's where the um, kind of false... Uh, well, I say that kind of the initial teaching is that everyone needs to be keto, everyone needs to be 20 grams, 30 grams total or less, and all that. I don't think that's true anymore. And I mean, I, we protected a body of knowledge about keto, and we're still doing that to say, you know, this is fine. You know, but I also acknowledge that not everyone needs that. And uh, in a vegetarian diet, it may be a little harder to keep the carbs under 20 grams a day getting complete proteins and getting the variety that you want. If you have eggs, it makes it a lot easier. Um, I just had someone whose uh, family member was uh, a, a interaction with someone whose family member was a chef, started making Indian uh, cuisine with curries and, and now he's getting into low carb naan, the, the bread with almond flour or other. So actually there are ways to, I think, address just about every ethnicity of every lifestyle across the board uh, if you don't worry too much about the food quality and the, the source of the, the proteins and fats too much. So our last question is um, from Alice and this one is a little bit controversial as well because of the shock and horror about what you may or may not say and I'm not sure what your thoughts are going to be on this but her question is what are your thoughts on vegetable oils? Can we use them and if not, what are the best cooking oils to go for? Yeah, so I think the, the type of oil gets into this category of lesser importance than the amount of carbohydrates. Um, let me put it another way. I've had people through my clinic, through my experience, who use vegetable oils and other oils, and they do accomplish healthy lifestyle goals. You know, they fix their diabetes, they fix the high blood pressure, the clinical problems that come when you eat carbs. Um, that said, um, is the advanced course, the omega-3, omega-6 ratio idea important? I think maybe. <laughs> um, uh, I, I'm not convinced yet that in a human, with humans, with people in clinical studies, changing so the, the, the vegetable oil to other oils shows you know, hard outcome improvements. Let me put it another way, is we can talk a whole a lot about the theory about things and about how things happen in a test tube, in a, in a, uh, a blood test. But I like to make sure that there's sufficient knowledge, kind of like what a doctor would want for a prescription drug. You know, we require that prescription drugs be tested in people over a period of time for a safety and tolerability uh, uh, um, threshold or window. So I, I don't know. So now, if you had a choice at the um, at the store, I think we're tending toward you know if you can and it's not on a, you know uh, outside your affordability, choose the sources 
of oils that are are not vegetable, not seed. But I don't know that it's a. It, it's definitely not essential uh, to do that, um, and um, I, that does distract a lot of people. Let me put it another way: you go to a restaurant, they're using vegetable oil. Don't sweat it. I mean, it's still. Uh, it, it's not like it's poison, although. Um, it, it, uh, in the long run, when more studies become available, maybe it's something important to do beyond just lowering the carbs. But at this time, I don't think it's um, one of the big issue things to address at the beginning. You know, the thought occurred to me, going back to the artificial sweeteners, that a lot of people ask me, is there any evidence that they're harmful? And and people cite all of the this... Uh, um, especially aspartame. And, and, you know, I'm not persuaded that any of these are, are um, poisonous. I mean, like, so that a lot of people have them, they, they seem fine. Um, and then it's, it's harder to get data on the lesser, um, um, less frequent issues, like does aspartame cause, cause Alzheimer's, something like that. It's really hard to get good information about that. Um, and there's a lot of I think disinformation about how harmful they are when, um, again, I see them, I use them to get people off sugar. My ultimate goal is to get people off the artificial sweeteners as well. Uh, of course, I don't tell people that initially if they're too wedded to their sweet things. So you see there's kind of a strategy of uh, handling the sweet. Uh, but you know, if there were studies showing that these artificial sweeteners in people you know, and you know, level of evidence being like prescription drug, then I would be speaking differently, but I don't see that evidence there right now. Well, I found today's uh, episode um, particularly uh, fascinating and uh, I really enjoyed it. And thank you very, very much for all this information. Um, as always, if you enjoyed this video and you would like to see future videos, you can find us on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter under the name of Adapt Your Life. Um, you can also uh, subscribe to our uh, channel, hit the notification bell if you would like to be alerted every single time we post a new video, which is once a week on our YouTube channel. And if you enjoy this video, um, we would be uh, hugely um, appreciative if you would share and like it. Uh, it would mean the absolute world to us. Um, next week, we're going to be chatting about um, the ideal protein intake. So join us next Wednesday for our next episode. And uh, this is Dr. Eric Westman and Glenn Finkel signing out of Conversations with Dr. Westman. Thank you so much, Doc. Thank you, Glenn. Thank you.